Good morning. Welcome to The Truth in Love. I'm David Roper, evangelist with the Brown Trail Church of Christ, the congregation that oversees this program. Several times in recent months, we've had special programs on the family and on the home with excellent response from you, our viewing audience. You feel, as we do, that one of the great needs of today is for strong Christian families. Today we have another message on this vital topic. Our speaker is John Waddy, director of the East Tennessee School of Preaching and Missions in Knoxville, Tennessee. Today he's going to be speaking on God's blueprint for a happy home. It's good to have you with us, John. Well, it's a joy to be with you, David. I'm looking forward to the discussion today. We uh, hope you enjoy your stay in Fort Worth, and we're thankful you were able to come and to bring this special message to us. Well, it's a privilege to be here. I usually hit a snowstorm, but this year we've got nice weather for you. It change. looks good. Uh, the topic that you're going to be discussing today, of course, is one that a lot of people are concerned about, and quite frankly, a lot of people today just think there isn't any answer. It's just one of the things that's happening in society today. So. We hope that as you talk about a blueprint that you really have something for us. All right. Well, you know, I learned a long time ago that uh, it's not enough just to have instructions or rules or obligations or commands. We, we need a flow chart. We need some kind of pattern to give us an idea. And many daddies figure that out, I say, December 24th at about 11.30 at night trying to put all the pieces together. Well, when God ordained the home and family, he saw the need to give us a pattern, a blueprint. And as we open our Bible to the book of Genesis, we find that blueprint of the home that God built. I like to begin with the passages in Genesis 1, 27 and 28 that says, And God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. That passage really gives us the foundation, the beginning uh, instruction about the home. And I think it's important to emphasize that the home is really the most important institution in the world. I believe, frankly, it's more important than the church because a church is but the sum of its families. If you take away the Christian families, you have no church. And if our families fail, there will not be a generation of Christians tomorrow to fill the ranks. And surely the home is more important than society and government and the state because everyone knows that a society is but the sum of those families that make it up. And when our homes disintegrate and deteriorate, then our nation's in trouble, and I think President Reagan has spoken to that quite eloquently recently. And so the importance of the home is absolutely fundamental, and we are obligated to do our best to have good homes and to make our home like God wants it to be so that that will ensure its strength and success. Now, as we look at the Scripture, <clears throat> we notice some uh, very interesting uh, characteristics of that first home, and if we will keep those in mind, then when young couples contemplate marriage and home, they will do a better job. And when we who are older uh, have our problems and difficulties, if we'll go back to the blueprint and, and check our, our specifications, so to say, we'll know where we're in error and where we need to make our adjustments. Uh, for example, when we look at this home that God built, <clears throat> it's very interesting to me in the very first place that, uh, that it was a heterosexual type of home. That is, there was a man and there was a woman. And so I Think of the passage, Genesis 1, 28, and God uh, made them male and female and told them to be fruitful and multiply. God, from the beginning, always contemplated a home with a man and a woman joined together in holy marriage. And you'd think anyone would understand that. People sometimes chuckle when I say, oh, anybody knows that. But evidently some people don't because there's a very strong push in America today to, to recognize homosexual type of marriages and homes. But you know, God has spoken to that problem. Uh, in the scriptures, for example, in the book of Leviticus chapter 18, uh, Moses addressed the problem because it was a problem back in ancient times. He said, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. And I like to say to young couples, uh, this isn't just an alternate lifestyle. God says it's abominable. And we find Paul addressing that same question in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 26, 27. And, and he calls it a thing that's uh, contrary to nature and a thing that brings its own reward, which is, of course, the penalties that we see, the um, disease, the frustration, the psychological, the social, the moral conflicts and damage. And so every home should be based around a man and a woman joined together in holy wedlock as a husband and wife before God. And in the second place, it's very fascinating to me that when God drew up his home <clears throat> for the human race, he said, I want one man and one woman together for a lifetime. And uh, it's uh, 
kind of evident because he only made one wife for Adam and one husband for Eve. And uh, in modern America, that would seem very restrictive and uh, very uh, penalizing to a lot of people. They just can't imagine staying married to one man or one woman for 20, 30, 40 years. And yet, uh, here was the situation. Here was the first home. Now, if for some reason Adam grew displeased with Eve, he had three limited choices. He could take her as she was with her problems, or he could try to reform her, or he could just live alone. He didn't have many options. And I often say if Eve uh, didn't like uh, those days when Adam didn't shave in the morning, or if he had worked hard in the field and hadn't had his shower yet, or if he was a little bad about leaving his uh, trash on the floor, his newspaper on the couch, she could either reform him or take him as he was, or she had to do without. And of course, Jesus picked up on that thought, and he emphasized it in Matthew chapter 19 when he said, have you not read that he who made them in the beginning made them male and female and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they two shall become one flesh? And then he says, What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. God never intended that we have this promiscuous kind of divorce that's so common and prevalent in America today. In fact, in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9, Jesus went on to say, And I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, except for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And he that marrieth her when she is put away committeth adultery. Uh, God does not accept these uh, uh, quickie divorces, these promiscuous divorces of people entering into two and three and four and five marriages. In fact, he says they're adulterous if, if they do not meet his, his standards. In fact, it's important for young people to know that when you choose a mate, you're marrying for life. If there is death in this family union, then you're free to remarry with God's blessing. And if the innocent party puts away his guilty mate for the cause of fornication, God grants he or she the privilege to remarry. But other divorces than that always involve the parties in dishonor. And so we need to impress on young people, and as parents we need to, to stress this to our children, that you aren't old enough to get married until you're old enough to make a decision and a commitment for a lifetime. I read many years ago a statement that uh, people that get married the, the short side of 20, 80 percent of those marriages fail. Only 20 percent success rate for those who marry before they reach age 20. On the other hand, those who marry uh, at age 24 or older have an 80 percent success rate and only a 20 percent failure rate. Now something happens between 18 or 19 and 24 that completely reverses the, t the st uh, statistics about the stability and the permanence of marriage. And the difference is we grow up. Now physically, we're grown at 16 or 17 or 18. I was as big as my father and as tough as he, and I could do most any job he could, but I wasn't as mature in my thinking. Now I didn't know that when I was 16 or 17. I thought I knew everything he did, but uh, it didn't take long when I reached 24, 25. I began to look back and see, you know, he did know a lot. He was very wise. And just recently, my married daughter was home, and uh, she's now in that 24, 25 year range. And she was saying to my teenage daughter, she said, you know, just listen to Dad. He, he's right. And so I didn't believe it at first, but I can see now. Well, what happens is we've grown from being uh, a physically mature but emotionally immature person in our late teens to being both physically and emotionally mature in the 24, 25 year range. Now, not everybody will wait till the 24 and 25. I understand that. But, you know, just because you graduate from high school doesn't mean you're ready for marriage yet. Just because you can drive a car or the army will draft you or let you join doesn't mean you're ready for marriage. And so it's good to finish your college and get a job and work a while and, and go ahead and do some of that travel you'd like to do and date several different people and then choose a person and marry and settle down for a lifetime if you want your home to be built like that one that God built and be a happy home. But then beyond that, we notice that this home that God built was one where each new generation that came along, that young couple was to leave father and mother and cleave to each other and become one flesh. In fact, in Genesis chapter 2 at verse 24, when God gave Eve to Adam, he taught Adam those words. And Adam said, you know, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Now, that brings up another point that stresses the need for young people to wait till they're a little older. You're not old enough to get married till you're old enough to leave mom and daddy and to cleave to your wife. Uh, there has always been in America that thinking, well, you know, <clears throat> we haven't got any money, but we'll get married and, and we'll stay with her folks a while. Or we'll stay with my folks. Uh, they'll help us finish school. And then the problems set in. 
And, and uh, uninspired people looked at that situation and came up with some good proverbs, you know, no kitchen's big enough for two cooks, no house is big enough for two heads. Well, what they understood was that somehow or other when, when you have the daughter living with mom and dad and she brings home her new husband, it's hard for mom and dad to remember she's not the little girl any longer and to treat her as a separate individual adult, as a new family. They tend to supervise her and correct her and tell her how to spend her money or how to conduct her business and her husband resents it or she resents it and then the problems set in. Or if they go to his folks' house, well then his mom and dad, you know, they have a hard time forgetting that this uh, 20 year old boy is not our little boy anymore, you know. We told him when he could go to the show and told him how to spend his money and to do his homework and now he's still with us so we tell him, you know, how to do his business and which job to take and how to uh, raise his family and you've got conflict. So, I often say to young couples who come to me for consultation before marriage, you know, if you're not able to move on out into an apartment somewhere and, and to begin on your own, then you need to wait a while. Even if you have to put a mattress on the floor and sit on a milk crate or something, uh, better to do that and have your own place where you can leave mom and dad and cleave to each other than to try to conduct your uh, marriage in the home of your parents and then have conflicts and have troubles. So then they need to be old enough to leave and cleave. And then the next thing we notice about God's blueprint is that the man and woman were to become one flesh. A man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife and they too become one flesh. And Jesus emphasized that again in Matthew 19 and Paul did in Ephesians chapter 5. There are three areas, uh, David, in which a couple become one. The most obvious is uh, sexually, the intimacy of marriage. They give themselves totally to each other they're th as though they're just one. But then there is that adjusting that occurs. Here's a, a young man that grew up in a family, perhaps rural. She grew up in town. Uh, perhaps he was of one religious background, she of another. Perhaps his family was very sports-oriented, hers was not. Well, they've got a lot of differences, and they're going to have to learn to think alike and and uh, share things together and have common interests and common goals. And we all know about that. Everybody that's been married talks about, well, those years of adjustment are kind of rough. Well, sure they were, because we're learning to think alike and to, to value things alike and have our priorities alike. Well, again, this, this features, I think, some of the advice that older people tend to give young people. When you get married, you need to have two or three years for this period of adjustment before you start bringing your babies into the world. Uh, it's tough enough fighting out our differences and hammering out our, our conflict so that we can have a common point of view. And then you bring a little baby in and he's caught right between the hammer and the anvil. It's tough on the little child. So I really encourage couples, you know, plan your children and, and be uh, careful in your uh, thoughts and planning of life so that you've had time to work out your differences before you uh, begin the family growth uh, process that we're talking about. And I often use this kind of humorous illustration. Here's a boy that grew up in the country setting on the farm. They got up at four o'clock. They had to milk the cows and feed the chickens and take care of the pigs and all of that. And then mama always had that big breakfast with the biscuits and eggs and the sausage and the gravy. And, uh, and he goes to school on the bus and he comes home, more chores to do, and he works Saturday morning. If he's really been good, dad let him borrow the pickup Saturday afternoon and give him five bucks to go to town to the show and take his girlfriend. But he falls in love with this beautiful girl down at the high school whose daddy's a banker, and she lives right near the school, and so she can sleep till eight and grab a glass of orange juice and dash out the door and be there by 8.30, and he gave her a nice car on her 16th birthday, and she get $25 a week just for fun money, and uh, you know, they stay up late and watch a late movie and then go to bed late and get up early, uh, get up late in the morning. And, and they fall in love and get married. And you're talking about some adjusting. They really have got it. First morning, he wakes up at four and he's hungry. He wants breakfast. And she pulls a cover over her head and says, you know, the cornflakes are in the cabinet. Help yourself. And, and they've got problems. And she needs uh, some spending money to buy makeup and have her hair done. And he gives her $5. That's all he ever had. And she thinks, well, that's not enough to even buy, you know, one tube of lipstick. And he thinks she's extravagant. And so they have a hard time adjusting. And after a while, they work it out if they're fortunate. And he eats down at the uh, restaurant every morning and gets bacon and eggs on Saturday, maybe. And she learns to get up a little bit earlier and see him off to work, and he sleeps in a little later, and, and so they adjust him. But there's a third area, and that is spiritually. And especially if you have people who have different religious backgrounds. Uh, sometimes it's a tremendous clash when they come together in marriage, and, and uh, she's Catholic and he's not. Uh, and maybe uh, she's a member of a Baptist church, he's Methodist or whatever. And everybody knows 
that really there's an advantage to people if they marry someone who shares a common faith. And so I really urge young people to always marry someone who is a member of the church. And I think Paul spoke to that in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 where he said, Be not unequally yoked with an unbeliever. And then he notes some obvious things. What fellowship hath light with darkness? What communion hath Christ with Belial? What, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? And so that which should be our strongest bond in marriage is our common faith in Jesus and the Scriptures. But if we're already at odds on that, we've got trouble when we get married. So marry a Christian. You'll be glad that you did. Well, briefly, let's notice two or three other things about this couple that God put together in his first home. It was a home with God at the heart and center. I remember back in Genesis 1, God created them. The Bible says God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. God made them. God blessed them. God spoke to them. He gave them instructions. He gave them this beautiful home in Eden. He provided them everything that they needed. And then he gave them some responsibilities. Well, we need to remind ourselves if we want a happy home, it needs to be a home with God at the center, a home founded on God's Word. And so in Psalms 127 verse 1, we read uh, the psalmist saying, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. And probably that lesson has been missed so much in America today. That's why we've got so much trouble. People are trying to build their homes without God. And so we ought to have a home ordered by Scripture, a home where we worship God at His church regularly, and when the church assembles. But we read the Bible daily, we pray together, we give thanks for our food, we settle our problems in light of Scripture. That's the home that God built. Let me mention these other two or three, and then we'll discuss it a little bit. Theirs was a home blessed with children, by the way, and that's really a, an important thing. And, and today it's sad in America that so many people don't want kids. God said, be fruitful and multiply. Before He gave any other commands about worship and living, He said, plan to have children. Now, some folks can't have children, but don't be one of those who throw away one of the greatest blessings of life, the ability to be parents. Rather, let those children be born into your home and raise them to the glory of God. And, and in that home, there was work and responsibility for everybody. Even in the Garden of Eden, in paradise, he said, you tend the garden, Adam. You need that. Boredom is one of our greatest enemies. And parents need to teach their children how to work and how to provide for themselves. In Jesus' day, the Jews had a little proverb, he that does not teach his son a trade trains him to be a thief. And folks, a lot of parents in America have failed in this today. Teach your children to work. It's easier to pay someone else to cut the grass, but your boy needs to learn how. It's easier to put the dishes in the dishwasher and push the button, but little girls need to learn. It's easier to go out and eat, but better to that little sister learn how to cook and prepare a meal. And the man was the head of that first family, by the way. God gave him the authority to make those decisions that had to be made, and the woman was to be in subjection to him. And that's a very unpopular thing in America today. But throughout the New Testament, the Scripture says that the wives are being subjection to their own husband as to the Lord. And I think that one of our greatest needs in America today, one, is for husbands who will accept the responsibility of the head of the family, and two, for wives who are willing to accept that themselves. And then last of all, there were rules and standards in that family. From the very beginning, God said, now, you can't eat of this one tree. Now, we just can't raise our children to have a decent home unless we have some rules and standards. Uh, everybody has to fear God and keep His commandments. But we need to teach our children to respect the authority of their parents. That helps them then get along in school and get along in society and get along in their jobs when they grow up. Now, that's the blueprint God gave, and it's desperately needed in America today. And we'll all be happier if we would model our home and family according to this. Well, <coughs> you are, of course, keep pointing to the Bible as the blueprint a lot of people, of course, today would say that this is outdated. Oh, that was fine, you know, uh, for 50 years ago, 100 years ago when people didn't know any better. But times have changed, society has changed. But I, I notice you keep pointing to this book as well, the authority. those who say that usually are those who haven't really given it a try. Someone has said the Bible has not been tried and found warning. It just has never been tried yet. And so people conclude it won't do the job. Around the world, there are multiplied millions of families who have learned the lesson, sometimes early and sometimes later, that really this book is as relevant and as meaningful and as up-to-date as, as anything that you could possibly find on the book rack today. And it speaks to man's most basic needs. And, it, and the reason being, of course, it came from God, and God is timeless. It, his knowledge is omniscient. It has no dimensions or limits to it. And knowing everything, He knew us and our needs, and He gave us a pattern that would work. You said somewhat about authority, if I can just use that word. It's not a popular word today, but the word authority. 
and you said now the, the, the father is the head of the home, and you also mentioned there were rules and regulations. Could you say a little bit more about this matter of authority? Because, again, this is unpopular, and we hear about human rights. Everybody has their rights. You know, we, we can't even impose our rights, our, our, uh, our will upon our children, or something else along that yeah. line. Can you say a little bit about well, this matter of authority? Well, <coughs> Solomon had some great words along this line, Proverbs 189. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother, <clears throat> for they should be a chaplet of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. Now he means jewelry, something attractive and beautiful. It's good advice to young people that they learn to respect mom and dad. Now, the kid who doesn't learn that's in trouble. If he doesn't learn it at home, he's immediately in conflict in school. He learns it uh, when he gets out and drives his car. He doesn't want to stop at the stop sign or drive by the speed limits. He learns it when he gets on the job and he has to be there at 8.30 and he comes in at 9. So he loses his job. And uh, as... Uh, restricting as that seems to modern minds with all their desire for total liberty. If we live very long, we learn that you can't have total liberty. We have liberty under law, just like we do in the United States as far as the government goes. And so in life, we have freedom, but there are responsibilities to go with freedom. And so we're training our children to respect those rules and regulations. I uh, had to smile a little bit when you talked about adjustments because uh, I remembered in my family, uh, my daddy, uh, always slipped in and my wife's family her mother slipped in and so when we first got married you know we punched each other who's going to get up first All right <laughs> uh, can you say a little bit about these adjustments because I think uh, uh, even though uh, we kind of know it's not true we still are, are uh, kind of living with the thought they they got married and lived happily ever after yeah. and and the thing I'm going to take my life, and, and I'm determined to make it work. Well, it's important that there be a commitment. This marriage is going to last. You know, with God's help, I will never, never back away from this marriage. But the other thing is we have to be flexible. We can't always eat what I grew up eating at home. We can't always have the same friends over that I prefer. I'm, I'm now joined with a woman, and so we have to jointly share these things. And marriage is a joint venture, and it's a sharing. And and uh, if one of the other members are so stubborn they have to have it all their way, they're heading for disaster. So even when our children are young, we need to be planning in their little minds and hearts, you must learn to share in life. You must learn that you can't always have your way. And selfishness is a root of all kinds of problems and evil in life. Well, I wish we had uh, more time. That's all the time we have, John. We hope that our program has helped you out in the viewing audience and that God will bless your home. Our sincere thanks to John Waddy for being with us. Now, before we close, we have an important announcement about a special series of lessons coming up, and I'll be telling you about that right after this song. <laughs> 